thanks to Montira's uh, presentation yesterday, we have a nice solid foundation of what intangible heritage is, what the goals and aims of UNESCO are, um, and, and now we're going to twist that up a bit, deconstruct some ideas, and, and really uh, question some of these things. But, but it's good to know we do have a nice idea of that UNESCO perspective. So uh, yesterday I briefly introduced myself, but uh, only because today I wanted to talk a little bit more about my research since it pertains obviously to this field school and, and today's talk. My research, uh, the general question uh, I was investigating um, is this idea of safeguarding intangible cultural heritage in Northeast England. And my, the angle I used was a museological angle. How can museums effectively safeguard intangible heritage? And so I, I conducted interviews around 12 museums in the Northeast of England. But right now I'd like to talk more about uh, these three expressions I also uh, studied. So the Northeast of England, just very briefly, uh, in my research consists of uh, three counties, Northumberland County in the north, Scotland uh, is above that, it borders with Scotland, Durham County in the south, perhaps you've heard of Durham University, and Tyne and Ware County in the middle, within which the city of Newcastle is located. And the three expressions that I'll be talking about uh, really have evolved within these three uh, counties, although the borders have changed over time. So I was looking at uh, general folk music, um, uh, excuse me, um, living traditions. These are folk musicians playing fiddles, bagpipes, uh, a bit of a drum uh, out in the countryside west of Newcastle. And this tradition is generally called Northumbrian folk music. Uh, this idea of Northumbria, it's an ancient kingdom, it's a bit mythical, this, this use of the word today. But really the music is unique to the Northeast. It's a mix of uh, Irish uh, uh, traditions as well. Um, it's a, it's a big uh, melange of, of uh, uh, musical um, uh, styles. However, it's unique to the northeast of England. These are students at a summer school at Durham University learning Northumbrian style music on fiddles. I also looked at a bagpipe that's unique to the northeast of England, uh, the Northumbrian small pipe. This is a young performer competing, uh, uh, performing at a competition in the north of the northeast in a town called Annick. And I also looked at a sword dance uh, called the Rapper Dance. This grew out of the coal mining villages of the region. And it's important to note that, in my opinion, um, these, these traditions are thriving. And it's mainly because of young musicians, as you just saw, and dancers joining this network of, of uh, ICH practitioners. Um, and so at least for the next couple decades, uh, these traditions are OK. And with respect to this part of my study, I really wanted to know how they're being safeguarded. There's no museum intervention, there's no UNESCO intervention in safeguarding these traditions. It's community-based, community-controlled fully. And what really is being safeguarded? So through my in-depth interviews and participant observation, but excuse me, mainly my interviews, I was uh, talking to the dancers and musicians and, and safeguarding, they, they realize they're, they're ab absolutely uh, contributing to the safeguarding of these traditions. However, that's not their real purpose. They just love them. They're enthusiastic about them. And also they're significant because of senses of belonging, being part of a family, a group, uh, senses of belonging to the region as well, the history of these traditions, senses of pride, they're proud of the region, the, the history again, the evolution, proud of the dancers and musicians that came before them sense of place, this expression of the Northeast through these traditions, uh, and also coming from this part of the world. And, and these, these three living uh, intangible expressions also help them define who they are. So there's a sense of self or identity. That's also uh, what makes them important to, the, to, to these practitioners. And in a more general sense, what, what values are being um, expressed collectively by this network as a whole, uh, at rehearsals, at pubs, uh, where they play in informal performances, more formal uh, 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 events. Well, values such as teamwork, which really was palpable just through participant observation. Uh, this idea of working together with a common goal, uh, not only during rehearsals, not only during performances, but uh, in between being a part of a team. 
altruism really was definitely observed and felt and talked about in the interviews. They're very generous people. They respect each other, those who have come before them, and also novices, beginners, those learning, as well as those that are more professional or internationally uh, recognized. And this is a bagpipe player at a competition again. And what I really learned that's important for today is that intangible cultural heritage is embodied by people. It lives within them. They, the heritage travels with them. So it's this loose network of dancers and musicians and where they meet, that's where it's expressed. That's where the intangible heritage is. And it also consists of ever-changing interconnected relationships between these practitioners, the people, their heritage, and the places within which uh, this heritage is expressed, it has evolved. So really, it, 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 the key to safeguarding, uh, I've argued in my research, is keeping these general three entities together, that they change together, that, that, that they're, they're interconnected, uh, uh, these ideas. This is a picture from one of the harbors up in, on the coast of Northumberland. It's called Craster. So today I'm going to be, uh, although uh, yesterday we had a bit of an introduction, uh, I will be talking about that current framework that we know today for safeguarding intangible cultural heritage. What is it? Uh, where does this concept come from? How is it structured and, and shaped? Then we'll look at some of the, uh, the precursors. Uh, you know, as we all know, cultural practices and beliefs are nothing new. They've existed for as long as um, human communication. However, this term is relatively new. But let's look at some of the earlier ideas behind looking at cultural practices and some of the inherent uses of this concept of intangible heritage. What are the parameters of this concept? What isn't intangible heritage? Again, as prescribed by UNESCO. How do we apply? When we have this concept of intangible heritage, it's an application of this concept, which really is a selection of what gets that idea, what gets that title. I'll quickly go through the legal perspectives in, in, in this, this uh, discourse. Uh, this generally goes back into the history of the convention and, and UNESCO's um, role in safeguarding intangible heritage internationally. I'll quickly uh, touch upon some museological considerations, particularly fossilization, this idea of uh, killing, in a way, uh, uh, living expressions of heritage. Then we'll move on to more general anthropological considerations, focusing on this idea of folklorization. Um, and then we'll be looking at some of the benefits after all that critique. Maybe there are some strengths of this convention. And then we'll also be, uh, sorry about that, summarizing uh, some of my key points. So the current framework, again, we had a nice introduction yesterday uh, by Montira. But really, it's important to understand the structure of this framework. It is structured by the convention. It's the convention that conceptualizes this idea of intangible heritage, where the concept is shaped. It's through the convention that this, the idea of intangible heritage is promoted, and mainly through national inventories, lists, etc. These are the instruments of the convention, the tools to publicizing the idea. And it's through the convention that we, we strive or hope or wonder if intangible heritage will be safeguarded. But it's really important to note that while this is the structure, what propels it forward? Where do the actions come from? What are the machines? What's the machinery of this, of this uh, framework? And Kirsten Black Gimblet uh, so uh, uh, cleverly uh, notes that this structure, this, this framework, is propelled forward by traditional museological values, such as uh, we, we see something as important, we designate it as heritage, and then we must preserve it. And also traditional museological functions, such as identification, listing, selecting, inventorying, documenting. So really, this idea of intangible heritage, this term is new, but the, 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 the machinery of this framework is really uh, traditional uh, in, in a sense, uh, particularly in the museological context. And why do I call it the current framework, uh, and also Montira did? Um, well, again, it's very popular. Uh, she also showed a map um, of, of the nations that have signed on to the convention. So it's widespread. Uh, it's the mainstream approach. Uh, we, we, there is the possibility that the guidelines, the suggestions of, that are put through this, this convention are, can become more standardized. So this is the framework. This is the mainstream idea. And Tonga and Fiji didn't make it on the map, just so you know.